Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, welcome to the trial of my client, Mr. Daryl Wright. Oh no! <laughs> he stands accused of paying some listeners of the Nintendo Jump podcast to quickly boost the show's listens to over 10,000. I didn't... I, I, I may have done that. <laughs> <laughs> Honorable Judge Kevin, please turn your attention to Evidence Exhibit A. This is a note that says, yes, I did it, Decoy was here. No. Your Honor, I have made a discovery that will turn this case on its head. We have been looking at this note all wrong in this trial. If you take that note, you turn it upside down, and you hold it in front of a light source, you will notice that it's actually a very intricate series of Morse code patterns. The note actually says, take the fall and I won't hurt Celeste. Your Honor, this is clearly blackmail. My client is innocent. <laughs> I rest my case, and I hope that you grant the right verdict. <laughs> How fitting is that? I mean, I didn't do it. I wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, my my future's in jeopardy. Apparently, so yeah. Oh, send no. your applications in to Nintendo Jump Podcast <laughs> at gmail dot com. <laughs> you may be replacing me. To be continued. Welcome to the Nintendo Jump Podcast, a weekly discussion podcast created for Nintendo gamers by Nintendo gamers. It's the week of April 8th, 2019. This is Sergio, and yes, I am joined by Daryl. What's up, everyone? And by Judge Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> What's good, everybody? I, like, He's what, had a little up? too much kombucha today. A little too much. Oh, yeah. A little bit much, yeah. Uh, but no, I'm, I'm, I'm doing great. I am ready to go. It is just, oh, it's been a, been a long day. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, Phoenix Ray came out on the Switch. Some of us got it, even though we're not going to play it. <laughs> <laughs> but, Kevin, what are we talking about this week? Well, today we're going to be talking about a bunch of listener mail. Oh, oh yeah. That's, it. <laughs> that's all we got, just a bunch of listener mail because, you know, from our fans, there's just a lot of, a lot of questions that come our way. And, you know, it's always good to <laughs> well, that's what, check up on the list. That's what happens when we actually have topics every week. This gets piled up, and then, then we got to do one Boom. of these. So <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, we got, we got a few really good topics, I think. So let's, let's do yeah. it. Here we go. Sounds good. And we actually have a question from someone that hasn't really posted it on our Discord. So <laughs> An outsider. <laughs> this is by Nini Queenie 24 from... Uh, a uh, podcast friend of ours, Haken. And Nini says, I have a question. I'm planning on getting the Switch the 24th of this month, but I'm worried that the Switch Pro will come out shortly after. Should I wait? What a great mm. question. That, Man, that yeah. is <sighs> a good question because it's a, it's a question of do we trust the rumors specifically on the timeline? Right. And so if... <sighs> In my opinion, go back to the previous console revisions, DS Lite, Game Boy Advance SP, and so on and so forth. If you ask me a couple months before they might be coming out whether they sh you should wait for them, the answer would be yes. Now, I don't think that the original version of the Switch has maybe some of the, the glaring faults that the, the other ones that I just mentioned did, but... Uh, you know that's that's me, me with just this console and and nothing to really compare it to. So I I don't I don't know. It right. I, I guess it depends on like if if they announce the new consoles. I mean, <laughs> dollars for donuts. It happens at uh, at E three, right? right? So right. <laughs> if if it's between April twenty fourth and waiting for June to see if they actually uh, announce something, uh, I I think that's a priority call. To be honest, I don't think. Uh, offhand, I don't think the Switch revisions are going to be huge upgrades or anything, but if you're getting a little bit better something for the same amount of money, that, I don't know, it makes sense to me. Yeah, and that's that's exactly what I was thinking. Like you said, just waiting, it's probably given less than two months now. If you can wait that and just find out if there are new revisions in either one of them, if there is two revisions, if either one of them interests you, then great. If not, even if two of them come out, and the regular switch might drop in price so you can still get what you want for a little bit less yeah i say wait and nini i know she like me is a huge fan of animal crossing 
Ah, Nini, I'm sorry to say I, I'm I'm not seeing this in Haken yet because I don't want to get lynched. But <laughs> <laughs> I think Animal Crossing is gonna get delayed to 2020. I no, I still don't. I don't. Uh, I just think Nintendo has enough, man, for the rest of the year. I still think they'll release by Christmas. I mean, it it, it would be good timing, and yeah, I would definitely wait. Um, like a good way to you know just pass the time was just to keep up with the news of Nintendo Switch. I mean, I do that like, all the time, even though I have a Switch. But uh, even when I, even like just before the whole thing was going on, like I, every day just Google like anything on Nintendo Switch, any rumors, like it, even though it's just all these news were going on, like it's always nice to just keep up with the gaming news. And um, and there's other things you can play too, um, even on your mobile phone or like if you have a console on hand. But um, yeah, I would definitely wait for a couple months and see what they say in uh coming e3 so oh sounds good so yes wait <laughs> if <laughs> <Yeah>. you can <laughs> just wait yeah uh, yeah the flip side is if you do pick up the new the the current model and a new really cool one it starts coming out there's a good chance you can you could flip it for not that much of a loss you know so you, you talk about maybe uh maybe losing about 50 bucks to to play for two months i you know mm. it, it's it's a personal judgment call to me i i I, I, I don't know exactly what your situation is, uh, but there's a at least I, I would say at least a fairly good chance that we'll know more uh, very shortly. So I think until we have the facts, you know, if if you're if you're that close, yeah, I think I think the smart right. move is maybe just to wait. Right. Right. Yeah. All right. I'll, I'll I'll take the next one. So this is actually a rather old one from Shy Guy. Sorry about that. Uh, does your preferred m- mode of playing, either handheld, tabletop, or docked, varied with the type or genre of game you play? So, Kevin, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think it does, especially if, for me, if it's a multiplayer game, I'd much rather prefer playing it on, on tabletop, you know, with a pro controller. I think that's, like, my preferred way, just because... You know, it's more comfortable. I know what I'm getting myself into with Splatoon 2 or Mario Kart. Um, that's the way to go for multiplayer games. If it's like RPGs, uh, I I switch between handheld and docked. More so handheld just because of how convenient it is, you know, just to like play on the go. And, you know, you don't really need to be online for an RPG. So, But if you're on docked, obviously, like, just the graphical output and just, you know, how... It, you know, when you're looking at the environments and the battle scenes and all that, it, it's a bit more, you, you feel more in tune, like just mm. having your TV there. And like, because I, I right now have a 32 inch TV that I play uh, in the docked format. So I think it just varies depending on, it also depends on my mood too. Like if I, if I feel like I want to be in my chair and just chill, have a, <laughs> a glass of kombucha or just, I just want to play handheld. If I am more hardcore and I want to just, Focus more on like a bigger screen, then yeah, I would go for Doc. So that's just my way of thinking about it. Nice. Um, as mm-hmm. for me, it it does have the the genre does have to do a little bit with it. I can see myself playing puzzle games more in in just handheld, laying in bed, or just not necessarily having to be docked or in front of the TV. That doesn't tend to happen because I play a lot of these puzzle games kind of like Baba Is You. I tend to play them while listening to my music and my setup is in front of my TV, so I'm kind (laughs) of tied there. (laughs) But if there's ever a game that... Like, I was actually thinking, I completely missed out. Uh, Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee, that would have been perfect for me to play in a handheld, but I just, again, my music calls me. (laughs) 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 But yeah... Definitely the genre. It, it does play a part of it. And if there's something like a really heavy action game or very fast-paced like Rocket League or Splatoon, yeah, I definitely prefer uh, dock mode. Mm. Yeah, for me, I mean, I've spoken about it before. Uh, I play probably something like 90% in handheld. Uh, like, I play almost everything in handheld right. from Splatoon to Rocket League to pretty much everything. Uh, my one really big exception is I do not play Smash on the Joy-Cons uh, for oh, for a couple yeah. reasons. One, they don't feel as good as a pro controller, and Smash is kind of a control-intensive type game. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, and, and two, Smash is a control-intensive type game that uh, ha- has a history of uh, breaking controllers. Uh, <laughs> I mean, see the uh, broken 3DS circle pads and such right, from, right. <laughs> from that iteration. So I want to protect the Joy-Con a little bit, you know, the... 
that's my window into most games so you know i don't want to i don't want to smash them as it were uh so yeah for that one i i generally lately um i actually got one of those little adjustable charging stands for the switch the the officially licensed ones hmm Super nice. Mm. Uh, actually, really nice. Allows you to, to plug in the charger, and, and it sits there, and you can adjust the angle on it. Really, really nice. What the system probably should have been built in with that functionality. Uh, but, it's you know, it's 20 bucks and it fits on, and it's pretty sleek. It's not too bad. So I got that so I can set it up on a little table in front of me and play a tabletop with a pro controller. And that, that feels a little silly because I'm, like, leaning forward to see the, this right. tiny, <laughs> tiny screen. But, yeah, that's that's what I do for most of the time on Smash Brothers. It, you know, if if I just have the TV to myself and you know it's it's not being used to watch something or or whatever, then yeah, then absolutely I'll play everything docked because I en- I enjoy <laughs> it. But that's just not that's not my situation most of the time. Generally, yeah, got got some TV show running or hockey or or something like that. So yeah, uh, I love the fact that the system is handheld, so I I use it a lot. <laughs> nice mm-hmm. stuff. All right, Kevin, what's your favorite question here? So my question that I like right now is by Lama Libre. With time being much more precious as we grow older, do you have any problems using the guide to play through games? It's hard for me to finish a game without one lately. I'll get stuck in a game long enough and just move on to another if I don't have one handy. That, Ooh. Excellent question. Yeah. I have I, a really good example for it right now. All right. You go for it. All right. I am currently... So, uh, I you know, I've talked before briefly on the show about Final Fantasy IX. Um, Mm-hmm. I am more and more realizing that this is an older RPG that does not exactly specify where you're supposed to go most of the time. So I'll find myself wandering around towns for like hours, <laughs> like literally hours <laughs> trying to figure out exactly, you know, where do I need to go to trigger the cutscenes that's going to uh, trigger the next part of the game? Cause I want to see the next part of the game. Uh, that, that was wearing me down a lot just because I'm like, well, I, I feel like I've explored most of this place, but the textures are kind of muddy, so I don't really know where I'm supposed to go. And and it'll, the, what'll happen is there'll be this little walkway to the side that I didn't see, and and I can't visually uh, differentiate it very well, uh, which might be a function of playing handheld. Who knows? Uh, but anyways, so I I switched to uh, in the town sections and anything that where it's a little bit less linear yeah i switched to just using a walkthrough and honestly that's helping <laughs> how it's moving through the game because then i can actually see you know the the strong part of that game so far for me is not it's not the labyrinth difficulty within the towns or anything like that it's it's the interaction with the, with the characters and advancing the story and stuff so in that type of game yeah i'll, I'll advocate for using a guide for sure mm. Nate, for, for sure <laughs> so <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned Final Fantasy IX because there was actually a strategy guide for Final Fantasy IX specifically um, back in the day. It, it was something called Play Online, and <laughs> honestly, it was one of the worst things <laughs> that you can have for a strategy guide. Like, it would basically be this thing where they'll give you a, if if there's something that you have some curiosity about, like a side quest or an item. There's a keyword you can put in. And then you can go to that website, and then it will tell you more. But then it's like, well, why don't we just why don't we just have that in the guide? <laughs> why do we have to <laughs> take an extra step to go online to see it? So it's like, okay, <laughs> I don't understand. I, I think it's just at the time, you know, it was like year two thousand, and you know, I think the internet was, I mean, it was obviously pretty popular, but it was still in that transition phase with Y two K and all that. Right, so right. I think. I think Square was like, oh, well, maybe this would be a good way to advertise <laughs> for more online stuff. And, yeah, we got to play oh, online. Wow. But it was, it was pretty bad. I even bought the Final Fantasy IX strategy guy at the time, so uh, I can speak on that behalf. So. <laughs> it just makes no sense. Like, why would you have – why would you link it in such a way where you have to take another step? I don't know. But <laughs> an interesting, interesting thought. Well, you know what? Okay, so I want to say I consider myself to be kind of flexible and rarely stubborn. But in this case, <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I, I don't like guides. I really feel bad and kind of a little bit angry or a good kind of angry against myself mm. when I have to end up having to look a, a solution up or uh, interesting thing that happened recently in some of our listeners where the, when it happened with uh, Baba Is You. Yep. I was stuck in the <laughs> prison level, <laughs> and a friend friend of the show, a uh, piece of Dan or Danny, he came over and 
he wanted to try it out and, and yeah he liked the game and then he said well show me that level you're stuck and i'm like no no don't ask me that <laughs> <laughs> I, I was afraid he would figure it out and sure enough he, he oh, kind of no. did <laughs> no, so no. yeah he, he thought of a solution and it ended up being i guess the only way to do it and uh it it Yes, it, it does bother me that he figured out and I couldn't. I was happy being stuck there forever, you know, prison for life. That's fine. But <laughs> <laughs> at least at least it was my doing or undoing or not doing, but not help with someone else or or even a guide. Um, I remember the last uh, Zero Escape game, the third one in the franchise. I got stuck in the very mm. first puzzle that I had to do in... I was there for hours and I had to look up a guide and it, it bothered me because it was the very first puzzle too. Lucky though, that was the only one that I needed to look up. But yeah, it, <laughs> it, it does always, it does bother me, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, Monty hit it perfectly here. Like as, as time grows more precious as you get older, if it comes down to I'm not going to play this game because I'm stuck in a section or I can I can use a bump and just kind of get through it so I can see the rest of the game, I'm going to do that. And you know, there's something to be said about something like Baba is You, where the entire game is trying to figure stuff <laughs> out. Like, okay, fair, <laughs> right? But if yeah. if it's just like, if it's just kind of this like side track thing, um, and I, I wanted to kind of get into like some of the old school strategy guides are actually really cool. Like, uh, mm-hmm. I've got a few of them that I I had as a kid. I used to get them. Uh, I I used to subscribe to Nintendo Power, and they would send you know every year. Uh, you could choose a gift with it, and it would you'd generally be a strategy guide or a shirt or oh, something yeah. like that. So mm. I ended up getting um, – there's there's a couple that really stand out to me. One was the Star Fox 64 strategy guide, which was, like, invaluable for knowing if, – if only knowing uh, what point values were actually required for the medals <laughs> on each level. Oh, yeah. You, yeah. Like, that was hard. In, in certain levels, I remember Sector X, I was sitting at, like, you know, 200 hits or something like that. I'm like, man <laughs> – that's pretty good. Like, what do I have to do? And the metal is something like 450. And I never knew mm. that. And it, that helped me figure out, oh, there's a secret path. Oh, okay. All right. Mm-hmm. I was just doing it wrong. Um, but that was a cool guide. A lot of a lot of cool pictures and, and kind of some background story. The coolest one I ever saw was uh, actually the the official Nintendo published one of a uh, guide for our, uh, Ocarina of Time, actually, where... Oh. The guide, most guides read like, okay, upon entering this room, look to your left. There is an eye, you know, shoot the eye and the door will, and that kind of thing, right? Right. This this mm-hmm. guide didn't do that. This guide was all third person telling the story of what Link did. Oh. And it was so cool. I remember like the inscription uh, for the, the <laughs> spoilers, uh, the, the Shadow Link fight <laughs> in the Water Temple was oh. like, uh, upon entering the room, uh, Link finds himself surrounded by uh, an empty room with water and a tree, and after walking to the end of the room, turns around and faces his rival, uh, Shadow Link, who is his equal, but eventually dispatched by uh, Link using a spin attack or something like that. Like oh. it, it, it told a story, but still tells you how to do it. Uh, oddly enough, that was not the way to beat Dark Link, but whatever. <laughs> whatever. Uh, I remember that specifically was being wrong because he would just backflip through it, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> anyways, uh, I really, really like that strategy guide. I've still got it, and I still just kind of flip through it because, again, you've got like you've got some of the really cool pictures from the game. It, it's telling you the story, and and the first time I played through that game was with a, a couple friends. One of us had a guide, another one was controlling it. And we would like swap roles every uh, hour or so. So. It was, it was a good experience, and I still have that. So, yeah, I mean, I'm not adverse to guides, and they at times they can be done pretty cool. Yeah, no, it's – I mean, it's a great way to think about it. I, I personally don't have an issue with guides either. I mean, I, I think the point is to enjoy the game, and no matter how you – the way you, the way you want to enjoy it, whether you just don't use a guide or you do use a guide, it's just there to help out. And, and there are – I have one experience where when I went to Japan – like 12 years ago, and I made a point to go to like the Kinokuniya or the bookstores back then. And it was, they're really nice because they had all these like different floors of different, just a lot of things going on with like pencil boxes and strategy guides from different games. And they had this one that I really liked from Ace Attorney Apollo Justice. And I didn't think it, I, I think at the time it didn't really come out in the US yet. I, I might be wrong, but I really wanted a strategy guide from, from that game because that strategy guide had a bunch of like 
original artwork from you know the artists and it was just really really magical i i still have it somewhere at home i'm trying i need to find it but that was one of the best strategy guides ever like i have to say the japanese strategy guides i i'm gonna be honest they i feel like they're a lot better than the ones that we have back here in america because i don't know why like every time i've owned like some sort of japanese strategy guide there's always extra stuff like with artwork or yeah. just developer commentary I don't know if it's I don't know if it's like a culture thing or that's just the way it is. I'm not they, sure. They but. do the same thing if you like buy soundtrack CDs um, and, right. and import them. The soundtracks will have like the the sleeve on the inside. They'll have a lot of artwork and such on it. The, the Crystal Chronicles one is beautiful. Uh, nice. I, I really like it. It's just eh, it's it's cool. It's good stuff. They, <laughs> they seem to care the about yes. the art of it, <laughs> which is nice. <laughs> yeah, it's great and. I think there's one thing we can learn from all of this. The way that Final Fantasy Night the strategy guide was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the IGN walkthrough is pretty good so far. So hey, shout yeah, out oh, okay. shout out to IGN doing pretty pretty well over there. Mm. Okay. That I I have seen that one before too, and it is pretty good. Like <laughs> it's not bad. They're telling you where all the it's hidden items are, which I'm you know, hit and miss. I'm not I'm not being too uh <laughs> obsessive about about finding everything but you know I, yeah. I do want to figure out you know where where am i supposed to go man because <laughs> this music is literally putting me to sleep and that's not a good thing oh yeah <laughs> all right sergio next question next question is by dragon and he asks how important is immersion in a game it's not mm. it's not oh wow wow <laughs> well i'm gonna i'm gonna go to this game that we keep talking about yeah, Whoa! You know, the, the game that we keep talking about, you know, Baba is this white character you control on the screen. It's a pretty good game. Uh, a little mm -hmm. hard to say, but Baba is this white character you control on the screen. Yeah, that's that's a no, no. <laughs> Baba is you, man. <laughs> this total immersion. That's that's the complete mm. immersion, right? There. <laughs> I don't know. I, I so it depends on the game obviously and mm -hmm. in a game that is story focused or lore focused or a anything like that i want to i'm okay with a game having some mystery to it that just kind of draws me in right i'm okay with you know it, it not spelling everything out but i do want to be drawn into games that are driven on story and and uh recent examples of that well and not even not so recent examples of it uh cave story did a really good job with not that much story um, <laughs> despite it being in the title, uh, it, it had a lot of story, but it, it's not, it's not too talky. It doesn't like, you know, just exposition at you the whole time. Uh, but it does throw you as, Hey, I don't know where I am really what's going on. These characters are like cool, but kind of odd. Mm -hmm. And then I think about something like Celeste, like I actually get immersed into Celeste story without, you know, very clearly that character is not supposed to be me. She is her own thing. Mm hmm. But mm -hmm. I love I love what they did with those characters. So if if you if you consider that a form of immersion rather than a um, some some people would call immersion like uh you know is the main character creatable? Can you can you make your own Corin and then you are Corin and it's not actually Corin? <laughs> I'm gonna name name them Daryl. No, that's not all that important to me. But I I do want to be brought into the game's world I, I think that that is important for any any time they're trying to push a story i need to i need to feel that you know right right gotcha and mm -hmm. i i do I, yeah i think that rpgs are great at this too because you know like you said some of them kind of give the the main character like an open personality since you can even name them from the beginning they might even be the typical silent protagonist like Link. This also reminds me of Isaac from Dead Space. In in the first uh, Dead Space, he didn't really speak. So he was kind of like Link, and I think hmm. that added so much to the immersion. And man, that game is immersive AF. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so good. I want that franchise back. <laughs> that's, an, that's an interesting point, though, because Link... Link is very much his own character. Like I, I know he's a silent protagonist. He's supposed to be kind of the the everyman, the the hook into the game. Right. But he's not. I mean, he's you know, no offense. He's not. He's not you or me or or anyone. He is Link, and right. you know him as Link, and you can rename him, and everybody will call you whatever. But that's still that's an immersive way to do it because he doesn't. You know, he doesn't have a whole lot to say <laughs> as it is. So. I, I like the way they I like the way a, a silent protagonist actually works as long as it's not just like awkward. 
<laughs> right. And and I do love immersion in, in every little uh, way that the, the developers can do it. If that means, you know, really stepping it up in terms of graphics just for the immersion, not for like ooh, pretty shiny polygons or any of that. <laughs> um, same with <laughs> audio. Uh, funny story, actually. So you, you guys are probably familiar with the, the recent reboot of the Tomb Raider games, um, like on the PS4 and yes. Xbox One. Yeah, sure. So mm -hmm. I was playing Tomb Raider, just the the first one of this new trilogy, and I was playing it on the PS4, mostly at night. The only light source uh, was the TV, and whenever you enter a cave, uh, Lara would actually she would light up a torch, and the light on the PS4 controller lights up orange, and I and I was able Whoa. to see this little bit of orange glow in my room. <laughs> ah, I love that. I know that's so silly. Danny makes fun of me for that, but I loved that little moment. <laughs> That that's awesome. I I actually you remember um like I I just spent last episode bashing it, but you remember when the Wii Motes used to like do little phone rings at you? Like some yes. some games had that, and then you would like <laughs> hold it up to your ear, and yes. they would, somebody would be talking to you through the Wii Mote. <laughs> that was one mm. thing that you know it's 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 gimmicky as anything, but I still kind of like. It. <laughs> I I think for me a lot a lot of it also has to do with emotional involvement with you know just especially in RPGs where, like, if I'm, like, Squall, like, in Final Fantasy VIII, and I'm, like, walking all around this open world of, you know, different places and all that, and, and I'm just thinking back in those days where, you know, the graphics weren't, like, how they are now, but it was just nice to feel immersed into, you know, a different world with, you know, different cities and, like, just in these towns where you can talk to NPCs. I, I think it just starts with the very simple things, um, you know, being able to... I had this one thing where... When I get into like a certain town, like I want to talk to every single person and try to get as much of the hints or mm. any sort of like side stories or just anything that I could possibly get from the game. I've had the same attitude when uh, when we got Octopath Traveler, um, just because there are certain side quests you can do that would involve certain characters, and as you go through chapter after chapter for certain characters, like you get to hear more of that NPC story. And I think that in itself is, I, I get emotionally invested in those sort of things. So being immersed, that's one of my favorite things, is just being able to talk to every single NPC that I can mm. possibly can, and like multiple times. So, <laughs> yeah. That's one, of the, that's one of the main strengths of Octopath, in my opinion. Like, I thought that the side characters of every story were like uh, amazingly compelling. Like for, mm. uh, you know, at, at times somewhat simply driven uh, characters, I thought they were really well done for the most part. Mm -hmm. And when they, especially when they would show up in other characters' stories, like so, you know, a side character from Alfin would show up in. Uh, I don't, I don't remember the exact sequence, but you'd be doing like Ulbricht's story, and all of a sudden he's there, and you're like, wait, <laughs> really? <laughs> you yeah. know, like, and then he's he knows somebody from Ulbricht's story, and then they're talking, and it. I loved all of that. I thought that the mm. the actual world building within Octopath, I thought it was really strong. Really, really strong. Agreed. And it's I mean, you guys have have you kind of heard the, the the sentiment that, you know, trust, you know, trust takes a very long time to build, but seconds to break. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Immersion is just like trust to me. <laughs> yeah. It takes a very long time to build and it takes a lot of things going right. But as soon as the controller does not do what I think it should do, done. Gone. Yes, mm -hmm. I'm I'm out. You know, and <laughs> I hate. So uh, the the question is phrased: How important is immersion in a game? And I kind of I kind of said yes. It, I like being drawn into the game, even more so. If I'm drawn out of the game from something stupid, I hate it. I hate mm. it. And and that's a that's a lot of what fueled my uh my Wii comments before because you know if I don't if mm. I don't feel like I have direct control of the game, if I can't forget the controller I'm holding, I'm not having as good a time. And and that's just mm. kind of that's, Skyward that's Sword. More, oh. Yeah, exactly. It, and that's that's <laughs> my one big comment against Skyward Sword is, you know, at, how 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 many times in the course of the game did you hit the recalibration button? It was oh. like goodness. I mean, I was probably in the hundreds, and and, and that's okay. And it ha that happens too a little bit in Splatoon, but again, I don't really care because that's just in the moment. That's that's kind of fun. Right. 
Uh, <laughs> but you know, if if you're like, man, I'm in this epic fight against uh, Girahim, and oh man, I'm down to my last heart. I'm gonna swing right to left, and I'm gonna hit. Oh, it didn't act. Oh no, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> it, oh, man, it kills me. It it kills me. So I think for the negative effects, yeah, extremely important to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess I we could say that. It's up to the developer how much immersion they want to put in the game, but it's better f- for them and for us as the players if it's consistent. You know, if it's not a lot of immersion, that's fine. But yeah. if it is a lot, yeah, you have to be consistent. Yeah, well, for sure. well said. Uh, so I'm actually I'm going to piggyback with another question that actually I think kind of relates to this, also from Dragon. So, hey, good job, man. In nice. games where you can name the main character or characters in which they already have an established name, if and how often do you change it, or do you opt to leave it as is? Do you name any characters after yourself? Ooh. So, Kevin, have you have you been going over to Naming Way and and changing all your characters' names to Kevin One, Kevin Two, Kevin Three? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know Kevin what <laughs> I, Kevin, that you know what for for testing purposes at work, sure, but not for. Um, <laughs> I haven't done it in games in a while, but I had this one habit of. Um, doing that for Pokemon. I think Pokemon was, you know, back in the day, you have, you know, red and blue. <laughs> like, literally, that's their names, red and blue. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, Pokemon. Full immersion. And, there you go. Right, exactly. And I'm thinking, like, well, it, it, just, it was just monotonous at the time, just having those characters' names be that way. I mean, I could see why they did that, but... So I would just name myself as as Kevin, and then I would name, like, my rival, like, maybe, like, a friend of mine who I get really p- competitive with um, at the time, or, or, like, a villain from, I don't know, like, <laughs> Final Fantasy VIII, like, Cypher. It was out of random. Like, there, I think there was one time where I would, I would actually name myself Squall in, a, 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 like, I think it was, like, second or third gen Pokemon game. I think it was Ruby. <laughs> and then I would just name my rivals Cypher. I'm like, oh, okay, great. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was in the mood of just having that. I think it just goes to show, like, when you play certain games and just the characters that stick with you, like, even so- something as a name just carries over to games that have no relation whatsoever. Although Pokemon and Final Fantasy, they're both RPGs, but they're totally different. And I think that it does play a role. And I mean, the fact that I would name... <laughs> I would just that, name that like, feeling when you're playing Pokemon, but you really want to be playing Final Fantasy, <laughs> <laughs> right? And it's just like there's just that emotional investment. I'm thinking, like, man, like, come on, Cloud, let's go catch that Pikachu. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, but I did have a couple times where I would name the character Ash, and just because like maybe <laughs> there was a time where I was I was watching a bunch of old Pokemon like shows, like from Indigo. Or Jota League, and like, oh, it was Ash, boom. So I think in that sense, that's what I would, that was the time when I would, you know, name my characters. But then nowadays, it would just be Wave. I think Wave is a probably more appropriate name for like maybe a game that I may or may not like knew about like earlier or just like a new game. I would just, it would, it would either be what's intended or I would name myself Wave because Wave is an awesome name. Nice. <laughs> that's part of my uh, handle, so. That's just my answer. Almost as good as decoy. Uh, what do you think, Sergio? Almost. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, for me, I mean, in Zelda games, Link is always Link, for sure. In, yeah. in Pokemon, I, I kind of... I expect those games to never really have a personality for the main character because I, I guess in a way it's it's supposed to be you. So yeah, I always Cut go... Cut to a shot of Red going, aww. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I always go with Sergio, but... Sometimes I go all caps. Sometimes I go just the first initial cap. Yeah. <laughs> so you ever put exclamation a... points afterwards? <laughs> no, no. Mm. <laughs> but, you know, if if a game allows me to change the name of a character, but if the game already offers something like initially, like a suggestion or like the official name of the character, I usually leave it. I, I hardly ever change it. Uh, there are a couple of games that may have even a list of random names. Unless it's absolutely terrible, I'll probably just stick with whatever I get first. Or if it's up to <laughs> me to name the character, I, I always like to, like, usually the game shows you a sprite or, or a look at the character, and I kind of like to think of a cool RPG-sounding name for them. I remember <laughs> in Final Fantasy One, I, I named my main character Albert. I don't know if that's cool oh. or not, but I liked it. <laughs> was, was it a red, uh, was it a warrior? Uh, yes. 
All right, that's that's a oh. pretty good name for a warrior. I mean, come on, that's that's not bad. Albert the warrior, Prince Albert. There we go. Uh, Ooh. <laughs> I'm kind of the, I'm kind of the same way. If a name is suggested, I just leave it because, and I didn't used to as a kid. I, I mentioned <laughs> I mentioned oh, yes. <laughs> before uh, Final Fantasy IV. I, I named Kane Daryl, and then I got upset about that when he left. <laughs> and I thought he I, I thought he was gone. Like I thought he was dead or something. So then I ended up naming mm. Sid Daryl. I was like, well, if he's gonna be my main character, then I'll I'll name him. Made some of the cutscenes in that game super confusing <laughs> because they're talking about each other and to each other. And I have no idea what they mean. Uh, and I did that a little bit as a kid, you know. You know, in in Final Fantasy One, the party members would be my family, <laughs> and and that would just be that would just be something. But now, mm. yeah, not really. I if if there is a suggested name, I just leave it, if only to be able to talk to other people about Corin and not like Matt or so. You know, like right. I, you know, mm. let's 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 leave the name as is. Uh, if a name is not suggested and there's just a blank, uh, then right. yeah, I just I I look at the character and I just I'm like, you know, what do you look like? And <laughs> and and I just I just kind of come up with it from there. Like you know, in Final Fantasy One, you do mm-hmm. name all your characters, so yeah, you you name them something cool. That that's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, for the most part, I leave it. I I just you know, I want the characters to be who they are if they if they already are. I don't need to. I don't need to impose my will on them. <laughs> but it's nice to have that option, though. But at the same time, like, as y'all have mentioned, you know, there's a reason why a character's name is the way it is. And it's always good to hear behind the scenes from developers on how, why they chose that name. So uh, it goes both ways, and you can't go wrong with either option. So Yeah, I, I mean, little little trivia thing. Uh, Link is named Link because the initial game was supposed to be more... Uh, like cybernetic, like actually like in the mm. digital world and he was supposed to be the link between uh two like circuits or something like that. And that's how oh. he got his name and it just worked. So yeah. Nice. Uh, d- did either cool. of you ever name Epona something else? No. Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> no. Nice. The only thing I did in, the only thing I did in Ocarina of Time was <laughs> you know, so the first fairly fairly early on in the game, you got to get through the the tree, and then you got to get to the the castle, right? Uh, mm-hmm. You get to see Zelda, and then she says, "Link, that's a weird name." So I, of course, I named him Zelda once, just so she called her own name weird. That was fun, <laughs> uh, and, and you know, you can do you can do some fun stuff with with any time somebody calls you something and then reacts to it. Um, mm-hmm. you know, you can, you can take that a number of, uh, funny ways, but yeah, <laughs> in, in reality, mm-hmm. yeah, not too much. Nice. All mm-hmm. right, Kevin, your question. Let's see. We're going to go with Shellshock's question. If there's a third party character that should be in every Smash oh. game forever or every other Nintendo crossovers, who should it be and why? <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> I'm thinking two characters. Both of them are blue. And I'm just uh, trying to think of blue. which one has more impact, more. Ooh. Which one would be more important to keep? You going with Mega Man and Sonic? Yep. Mm-hmm. Whoa. Mega Man all day for me, all day. He would be. <laughs> Honestly, if if Nintendo could buy Mega Man and just have that franchise, I would Ooh. love it. I would love it. Uh, if he could appear in Mario Kart and actually have like a Mega Man themed oh, wow. track. <laughs> Think Dang. think of the track that you could do with that franchise. It would be freaking phenomenal. And now Jeez. think of Sonic, and it's like, eh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, Mega Man all day for me on that one. You know, I don't personally like playing as Sonic in any Smash game. I'm going to say that right now. It's because you're a good uh, person. Well, no, but... <laughs> you know, well, <laughs> <laughs> Shout close. out to Sonic lovers, love you all. Yeah, to, uh, yeah. I, I love that. Love that hedgehog, but I, <laughs> but I do appreciate the history. <laughs> I think it's important to have a character like Sonic, though, because actually, you no, know, I have to go back real quick. I don't like using Sonic because it's super fast, and I can't really control him that well. So that's just on me. But so it's not my. It's like not my place though hmm. when, when I play Smash. But I think it's important that he should be in every single Smash game because. He has played a huge role in being that rival mascot against Mario back in the early 90s. And I think it's important to recognize that the way that he was represented at the time as the, you know, so-called cooler character, you know, blast processing and all that jazz. (laughs) 
Oh, how the tables have turned. <laughs> I mean, just, yeah, it, it's crazy because... Mario, boom, win. Right, okay, for sure. But I just think that it Sonic is a huge, important piece in gaming history. Um, just the way that he was being marketed for Sega and the rivalry between Nintendo and Sega. And actually, they're just, just learning about the history through... Uh, you know, reading books and the line. Ah, oh, there's this one book I have to look up right now. Sorry, can we just do a timeout? <laughs> oh man, my you have it yet? I got it. Okay. <laughs> okay. We're keeping that. I just looked at my Amazon Kindle app. Shout out to Amazon Kindle. One of my favorite apps because I, I read a lot from using this app. We know you're listening, Kindle. Oh, we you know you're listening. Um, not 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 the actual device, no. but the actual. Uh, <laughs> so, ooh, uh oh. Actually, it's more likely you know, the device is listening. But anyways, keep, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's a book that I would highly recommend, and I know this is going off tangent, but it's called Console Wars by Blake J. Harris. Mm. So I I highly recommend this book. I it, it talks about the history be- with Sega and how it came to be that competitor against Nintendo back in the late '80s and and just the early to mid 90s and i recommend it for anybody who is a video gamer like yeah it's good even if you don't yeah even if you don't like usually read like which which i have it for a while like when i was a lot younger but these kind of books are important like you you definitely it's worth your time so that's the thing and i think i just feel like sonic i don't know like he has a little more impact and especially like you said because of the history the rivalry but mm-hmm. okay let's say neither Sonic nor Mega Man. Anyone else? I don't even think Pac-Man like kind of is close enough to even those two. No, I I don't. Mm-mm. I, Mm-mm. Like you can make a, a statement that he's more important to gaming history. I, I I would potentially say, but those two, as far as characters I want to see in Nintendo games, I want to I want them to you know have some history with Nintendo themselves and you can definitely make that argument for Sonic you can definitely make that argument for Mega Man you can also make that argument for Banjo-Kazooie and mm. i would love Ooh. to see more crossover like this was a character that used to be at least you know I- i'm not exactly sure what the ownership was but it was a Nintendo characters like Banjo-Kazooie was a Nintendo franchise now it's not now it's owned by Microsoft and and <laughs> lent out hopefully uh <laughs> But I would love for them to come back, and I think you know Banjo was in Diddy Kong Racing of all things. I would love to see the those two in in Mario Kart again. Think of the tracks you could do with that franchise. Holy crap! You know that there's a there's a ton of stuff you could do. Yeah, th- those would be the ones that are currently not in Smash that I would actually love to see in there. Mm. Man, that makes a lot of sense. You know, one of the things that I thought about with having a third party character would be a Final Fantasy character. I was really glad to hear at the time really? when, yeah, I I think so. I I may I might be biased, but I think having a Final Fantasy character, sh- I, it doesn't it doesn't matter, it doesn't have to be Cloud. It could be anyone else, but just like somebody, just having, you know, I mean, there's just so much. There's a lot of history with Final Fantasy and Nintendo, and I think having him having him or her, like just having a character from Final Fantasy be in every single Smash game. I think it does play a huge role. Maybe we're playing on, you know, the legacy of video games in general with, you know, what it's played for Nintendo. But, I mean, it could be Cloud. I th- I would, personally, I would like to see a different change of, like, maybe in the next Smash, if they could have, like, Squall. <laughs> I keep going back to that, but... <laughs> Lightning. Just, but, I mean, honestly, like... my hope, my most hyped uh, Final Fantasy character would probably be a Black Mage. Like to be honest, that's mm, the, mm. that's the character Vivi. you know. VV is one, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. but that's the character that kind of defined the series. And it wouldn't be the first time they showed up in a Mario game. Uh, the Mario mm-hmm. Hoops game. Oh you know, yeah, <laughs> uh, Black and White Mage were both in there. So you know, it would be pretty cool to see. And that's more of an actual Nintendo <laughs> throwback, which I would kind of like. Or you yes. know, 
you've got a, a few really good options maybe from Final Fantasy VI that I think you could pull from. Mm-hmm. Um, you could pull maybe from Chrono Trigger would be kind of cool. I think Chrono Trigger would be good, yeah. Yeah, I like I would I would personally like when Cloud came to Smash One. That was a man. That was a mic drop moment, and and oh, yes. I I cannot argue with the hype that that brought, and I understood why they did it. I thought it was cool. Mm-hmm. But as a Nintendo gamer, I didn't feel anything for that. You know, I didn't care that Cloud was in there. And I know people who, who did. And, and I again, I understood the impact. But personally, yeah, okay. You know, it's it's Cloud. That's cool. <laughs> because he never, aside from, like, some cameos in, in games, he'd never been on a Nintendo system before. And, you know, if we're talking about a character that I, I like enough and I think has enough Clout to be in, <laughs> Clout, <laughs> uh, to be in Uh-oh. <laughs> in Mario Kart or something going forward. That's kind of my my staple. You know what could right. what would actually belong right. in, in Mario Kart going forward? Man, I'd love for it to be kind of a throwback to to something that kind of grew up with Nintendo. Mega Man is the perfect one there because he kind of yes. he kind of helped drive the NES. But you know, there's a few other characters I think are are really strong picks too. Yeah, no, I'm for real. I mean, Mega Man is a great choice. I mean, it's I mean. How can you not like Mega Man? Like, I don't know anyone who doesn't no. like Mega Man. No, I don't either. Even people who don't play games see him, they're like, oh, he's cute. You know? Yeah, it's got the little blaster. Like, yeah, no, little... he's awesome. He's yeah. not cute. <laughs> <laughs> okay, he's kind of cute, but no. <laughs> <laughs> he's cool. He's cool. He shoots his arm off and hits people with it. It's awesome. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm. Sergio, that's back to your question, right? Yes. We have a question by Big Shot. He asks... Is there a series or a standalone game where you have found yourself digging deep into learning more about its lore? And mm. when I saw this question, I, as I typically do, I had like a sidebar or like a sideways answer to it in a way. Mm. So it made me think of the Zero Escape games, particularly the first one, uh, Nine Hours, Nine Persons, Nine Doors. Um there's a lot of little stories in that game, like a, a lot, and they're all really yeah. good. The thing is, at, at least when I first played uh, the game and, and I f- was first experiencing these stories, they seemed so real, and I, I couldn't really tell if, if they were real or just made to feel real. And I found myself uh, going on Google and Wikipedia and trying to sort of find evidence if they were <laughs> real or not. Uh, That's interesting, yeah. Yeah, like there's a story about a sister ship to the Titanic called the Gigantic. I thoroughly bought it. <laughs> and that's that, that's just one of so many. And, and yeah, that, that series overall, it's always one of those that whenever I beat one of those games, I spend like at least a couple of weeks just pondering about the ending, uh, going on forums and seeing what people thought, different interpretations. Huh. It's an awesome moment for sure. Yeah, that is awesome. I, I mean, mm, I agree. For for me, so generally when I play through games that I really like, I, I play through them blind, kind of the first time. I don't spoil anything. I just kind of play through. And then the really good games, in my opinion, are the ones that I go back to and play through again. So mm. two big examples for that were uh, the original Fire Emblem on Game Boy Advance. I know it's not the first one in the series, but the first one that came to the U.S. Right. Mm-hmm. So you play through the entire game, you beat the game as these really awesome characters. I liked almost all of the characters a lot, like really, really, really nice. Um, and then you get uh, the ability to start the game as Hector, who is the best lord in that game, the axe user, blue, blue-haired, blue gigantic guy. And I was like, well, yeah, I want to start the game again as Hector. So I, I that's, the, that's the first game I ever just like literally played back-to-back. Oh, just all the way through, started up a new game all the way through again without playing anything else. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it, that actually changed a little bit of the story. You do a few missions, but how that relates to this question, in between, I knew I'd missed some extra missions. There are some things like, or some characters, like there's some people you can recruit that I didn't know that at the time, like some named villains that you could actually go up and talk to. This is my first Fire Emblem. I mean, I didn't mm-hmm. I didn't realize what the rules were. So in between playthroughs, I went and researched a lot of the extra stuff, like, okay, there's secret missions and stuff, and how do you actually like get good stats with these characters, and, and how do you do it? So the second game... The second playthrough, I kind of you know maximized as much as I could do on that playthrough, and my party was a lot better at the end uh, <laughs> because of it. But I had a lot more fun because you know late in that game, there's a there's a, an assassin guy named Jafar that you can actually recruit. I never knew that. I killed him the first time. I was like, ah, <laughs> screw you, man. Yeah, um, 
so the second time I actually recruit him and you can use him to recruit another character. It's just like, whoa, you know, it's, it's crazy uh, that there's all these little secrets and that's, I love that. Uh, and, and I loved that going into it. The other example was actually, uh, it comes back, you know, cave story. So cave mm-hmm. story has a lot of secrets. You mm-hmm. play through it the first time. Uh, if you're good at the game, you play through it the first time you find, I think five weapons or so, and then you can play through it. You beat it. You get a, an ending and all that. If you actually go back and research it, man, you missed a lot of stuff, like a lot of stuff. There's like a, a number of other weapons you can pick up, other upgrades, a different ending, a different whole area. Like there's there's a lot of extra stuff that I, I kind of knew I was missing as I went through just because some of the stuff didn't seem to be linked a little bit uh, right. So I, mm. I went back and I researched the game and then I'm like, oh, man. Well, I got to do that now. So then I restarted the <laughs> same same type of thing. I restarted the game. I uh, actually went through an optimization run. Had a ton more fun with it the second time. Like, it was great. Uh, kind of seeing, oh, man, you know, this character that died didn't have to die, and, and these other weapons oh, wow. are here. Man, this weapon's so much better than anything I had. Like, why did I not do this? <laughs> um, so it's, it's just – it's really cool. Like, I love games like that that maybe – Maybe you're a little deeper than you initially think they are, and you just do a little bit of research and see some people talking about it because they're really cool games, and you learn all this stuff, and then you take that back to the game and have a better time with it because of it. I love it. Uh, I love everything like that. Okay, so that's that's what I got on that. Uh, I guess the next question is actually mine, and I have a I have a two parter. Um, so mm. two questions from two different people. I hope you guys don't mind me cheating, but they go together. So I'm gonna cool. I'm gonna put them together. From Lama Libre, uh, with the discourse about difficulty in games popping back up, I was wondering what games you feel like you have dropped out of sheer frustration. Hey, that kind of goes back to what we were saying before. Uh, <laughs> are there any games you would get into if the barrier to entry wasn't so tough? And then Shy Guy followed that up. On a related note, does it make good business sense for developers to include a quote-unquote easy mode to ga- make their game more accessible, or does including such a mode sacrifice the integrity of the interactive art they have created? Yeah, you know, I could start with this one. I I think with, well, we start with Shy Guy's question. I think it, it does make sense for devs to do that. I mean, like, let's take a game like Celeste. It's not that <laughs> the, game. The best example of this ever. <laughs> it is. Like, it is not a cakewalk. Like, it is a hard game. Um, especially, But they, they do get you to a point where you, you have the tools you need to you know, dash and go from platform to platform, but it's not easy. You still have to put a lot more effort into making sure that you don't fall off. But at the same time, though, there is a easy or a so-called assist mode where they, where they'll give you more jumps. And I think that's, I think that's one of the ways to. <clears throat> I mean, you still have a challenge, but at the same time, at least you have like a, a buffer. It's not as difficult, and I think it doesn't take away from how beautiful and how uh, how good the game is. So. I think it, I think it does make good business sense. Uh, but but you have to be able to execute well. Like don't you want to make it too easy? I mean, another example would be Mario Kart Eight Deluxe, uh, with the way that you're it introduces you know the what uh, auto acceleration, the auto steering. I think sure that is it is actually a great idea because you know I've played with a lot of people who may not know how to drift. You know that well and it's okay because I, I think the point of the game is just being able to race and have fun like you don't have to be get you don't have to get too competitive um i do remember times where i did but in the in the very end like everyone's having fun racing and you know you can you create moments with getting someone with a blue show or a bomb or <laughs> or lightning i don't remember who won or lost it, it's really just about you know the memories and being able to race with your friends in different tracks and the music is awesome obviously so you you don't you don't keep a keep a win loss chart beside the the game. You just like check off. You're like, yeah, I got another one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, unless it's competitive, then sure. But I mean, <laughs> I mean, if you're playing with friends, like, and you're just having a grand old time, you know, just chilling. I mean, not a bad idea to do that. So, um, with Monty's question, excuse me, Mama Libre's question, um, one game that. I dropped out of sheer frustration was Demon Souls because man, that game was oh. so hard. That was that was the first game I bought on the PS3. I was like, great <laughs> game to get. <laughs> Excuse me, great new game. I bought a used game called Virtual Tennis Three, I believe. But then, but my first new game was was Demon Souls. What a great new game to get! And oh my goodness, like <laughs> I spent at least 
think 10 or 15 hours just going through, just trying to beat the first boss. And I'm like, what is going on? And um, I think at the time, this is the same time when I was playing Call of Duty too. So it was like, uh, like you know, my friends got me Call of Duty for, for a birthday thing. And I was like, great, I get to play this and go back and forth Demon Souls. And I started playing more Call of Duty because, you know, I, could, I have people I can play with. But with Demon Souls, you're on your own. It's like, oh, you know, it's too bad. So I, unfortunately, I did drop the game after, uh, you know, going. I was close to getting to the second boss, but I just I just dropped it. Um, I felt bad about it because I felt like maybe I could have put more effort into it. You know, but at the time, college work and stuff like that, or just with schooling mm-hmm. and and just my other priorities, I just felt like playing Call of Duty was just enough for my, my sake. And y'all already know from episode three how frustrated and how much time it took me to get to that 0.97 KDR that I am proud of, <laughs> which set me up for having a more enjoyable, competitive time in Call of Duty, you know, being being more competent to play that game. So Nice. Um, you know, as far as dropping a game because of how difficult it is, I mean, I did stop playing Baba Is You for a little bit, and then the whole <laughs> incident happened, and and that Uh-oh. kind of burned me out again. Oh, no, no, but but I'll, I'll come back. I'm still playing here and there. But I remember, I guess the closest I've been is actually Trauma Center, the original on the DS. Mm. Uh, oh, okay. Like the second to last mission is really tough. I know Danny dropped out too on that one, but. I kept at it, and I guess part of it is that, you know, you can tell that you're so close to the end that you might as well just spend, like, a week or so just really grinding this single mission because you're almost there, you know? Mm. As for accessibility in games, I think that's that's a great question in, in a very important topic. I think as long as a developer makes the game with the vision they have in mind from the get-go, right? Like, something like Yoshi's Crafted World, it's, it's a game that they kind of make a little bit easier than... Most games, you know, it's not as easy as a Kirby game or something, but it's it's a bit on the easier <laughs> yeah. side. Isn't that easier than a traditional Mario game? But even so, that's the vision that they had, and they made it that way. And then, it, to me, Yoshi's Crafted World feels like after the fact, they went ahead and added Mellow Mode, which it's even easier, mm. basically. I think as long as it's it's done afterward, it's not going to affect the integrity of the game or the original vision, then I think it's definitely fine. And I think it's it's good for most games to have it. I mean, the more the, the merrier, the more options you give the player, I think it's always best. Yeah, I would agree with that. And mm-hmm. so, I mean, Kevin, you started with Celeste, which I think is the shining example of how difficult these <laughs> games should be. Uh, in that, Celeste is a very hard game. And I tell people, if you're going to play Celeste, try it on the normal difficulty because you know it it ties in so beautifully with the story this actually should be a challenging game you should make it so it is a challenging game um but you know if it's if it's to the point that no i i I can't do this i want to drop it whatever i mean fine go adjust the speed to 90 percent, or go you know kind of tweak one of the other options because there's a bunch of different options you can tweak in there you Mm. can make yourself invincible but still have like, like the same jump requirements, or you can give yourself multiple jumps, or you can change the speed of the game, which is probably the coolest way you can change things. It just mm. gives you a little more time to react to things. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's so many there's so many options in there that <laughs> what's funny is uh, the the main critique I saw from players of Celeste, not so much the actual critics, but uh, people who picked it up were that the game was hard and they got frustrated with it. I was like, dude, turn on the assist. They're like, no, I don't want to do that. I'm like, well, <laughs> why? You know, it's not it's, it's not a loss. You know, it, just do it. See if you get better. If you get better at the game, turn them back off. You know, it doesn't it doesn't hurt anything um so much. And I I would I wish more games did that kind of thing like tweakable difficulty settings that, you know, it's not I used to make fun of Metroid games for this because so after you beat a Metroid game, you unlock the hard mode, which the hard mode is literally the same exact game, but you do less damage. The enemies do more damage. Hey, go mm-hmm. have fun. Uh, to me, that's not fun. That I, that's there's no there's no real accomplishment there. It just feels like a handicap for the sake of handicapping. I'm just like eh, mm. no, mm. you know, that's not what I want. And it, you know, some games do the opposite. They they make games easy. They're like, all right, you know, here's this game, uh, but we're gonna give you a ton more life. You know, now with new right, funky right. mode, right? 
Um, <laughs> funky mode is a little too far for me. Like, oh, yes. uh, I play <laughs> yeah, it, and you I... go from two hearts to something like seven. He can do all of everything, and he can just like bound through the levels. It's great for uh, speed running. I love playing as him just for like <laughs> trying to get through levels as quickly as possible and such. But um, you know, th- there's a balance. There- there's a mm-hmm. balance. I do think games should be accessible to more people. I I have no problem if you include an easy mode. I prefer that to making your overall game easier. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, right. to kind of the Kirby Yoshi point. I would prefer to have a, a at least you know don't don't give me a Snorfest game. You know, let me let me have some challenge playing it or you know some enjoyment out of that. But also you know put put in your mellow modes and and things like that so that you know maybe less experienced players can get through it. I'm I'm perfect with that. I love it. Mm-hmm. Um. One other point, so Mar- you brought up Mario Kart. Mario mm-hmm. Kart, I mean, if you remember, you have a bunch of different classes you can play too, right? So exactly, 50 cc yeah. is just flat out easier than 100 cc or 150 cc or 200. <laughs> oh God, 200. 200 um, <laughs> is a different beast. And I, I love that because, you know, my friends and I all used to play on 50 cc. And then as we realized, oh, hey, these other ones are actually literally faster and more fun. So we moved up as we kind of grew up. It's a cool <laughs> experience, you know? It was mm-hmm. it was neat. Mm-hmm. Um. So I think, I think to that I don't, I can't think of a reason right now offhand that a difficulty setting in the menu or anything has ruined the game or, you know, compromised the artistic integrity or or however you want to say it. Mm -hmm. Um, At times I don't want to use that difficulty setting like the Metroid thing, but does it make that Metroid game worse for it? Nah, not to me. Mm -hmm. Um, Does Mellow Mode make Yoshi's Crafted World worse? I I don't want to play it, but it doesn't make the base game worse. So nah, I'm I'm good. No. For for Lama's question, it's it's a little harder for me because I am stubborn. <laughs> I mm. am <laughs> extremely stubborn and uh, willing to just like bang my head against a wall until I get through something. Mm. So like most of the game, most of the times I have played a, a quote unquote difficult game, it's just been it's just been a matter of you know I'm going to beat this at some point. It just it depends on how much time I'm actually going to take to beat it. <laughs> the only games that I've walked away frustrated by due, due to anything in difficulty is just when I'm like, you know what? I don't want to do this challenge. Like I, I remember I got to the end of steam world dig two. And I think that that is just an absolutely phenomenal game. One of my favorite games on switch. Um, really, really, really good indie recommend it to everybody. But at the end, there's some of these trials and the trials are pretty cool. They're like really complex um, platforming puzzles and and things like that. And it's some really hard movements. Like some of them take some real dedication to do. The problem I have with that is I really liked it, but if you fail any of them, you have to start over. Oh, and geez. it randomizes it every time. And there's something like forty something of them. And I think there's some oh. some like checkpoints or something, but. That's one that I try it, you know, I try it three, four times. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's cool. I'm never doing this. <laughs> like, no, <laughs> nope. I, I respect myself way too much for that. So it's not, that's not frustration. It's not me throwing the game away or anything like that. It's just like, mm, this challenge is, is not really respecting my time. So, nah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I think the stubbornness that you're talking about, I mean, there's a lot of personal pride when you play games, right? I mean, with Celeste, sure. like, I know for me, I want to play it the way it was intended um, without assist mode, although I do appreciate the fact that they have that, but I want to see if I can get through it on the original difficulty. Mm. And, and, but I think at some point it's like, if a game's too hard, like, and you okay, did, like, right? Right. I did. I went, I, I, yeah, I went through original difficulty. I remember struggling a little bit at the very last, like, Oh, it's like when you're when you're I'm so close to the mountain and I'm like keep missing these jumps. I'm like, dang it! <laughs> yeah, it's I mean it. It's no joke. Difficult. That's a hard yeah. game. It's hard. It's, it's like, a hard but forgiving game. So when you die, yeah. it doesn't really hurt you that much. You just okay. I I didn't yeah. get past this one section. No no big deal. Yeah, um, it's not like you're. It's not like Ninja Gaiden where you have to go all the way back to the beginning oh, stage. Oh, and that, I, there's a, there's another one. If you're not respecting my time, Blaster Master, the original Blaster Master, oh, did not have a continue no. system. Like it had lives, no. and if you ran out of lives, you're done. Like, it, oh, go back man. to the title screen and start over. Um, yeah, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> yeah, I, I have to admit when I when I played Ninja Gaiden on a non NES <laughs> or oh <laughs> on my, yeah, on save state, I I advocate for save states in games that should have had save points originally. <laughs> I have to say I did do that, and when I got to the final like 
bosses, not boss, but bosses, when I died, I just went back to, <laughs> you know, the... If I if I die in the, the like I think it was like a third stage of the boss like I just go back to the first stage I'm like yeah <laughs> like I don't want to just go back to the very beginning just the the, the the stage where you have to go all the way back and you have to traverse through the region and then you get to go to the boss but yeah I I have no shame in that um, although I think at some point I did wish that maybe if I did if I were to have a point where yeah maybe I should have played originally as intended but no shame so. Ninja Gaiden, awesome <laughs> game, but super difficult. So, all right. Well, I think that's I think that's it for the questions we're actually going to get to. We do have a couple still on the list. Sorry, guys. I will I'll keep those on the list for next time. All right. In that case, it is time to jump on out of here. I really, honestly, thank you guys for listening. Um, as we mentioned, kind of at the top of the show in in my my fake trial, we did recently hit ten thousand listens, and that. That's amazing to me. I I can't I kind of can't believe that. So thanks to everyone who is out there, and we're just gonna we're just gonna grow. And <laughs> as as shy guy put it, we're gonna go to a hundred thousand listens. Let's do it. <laughs> if you would like to chat with us, I think this is absolutely the best thing you should get out of the show. We have a, a really awesome community on Discord. Some of my favorite people on the internet are in there. So the description of this episode has a link to it. It's also linked on our. Uh, Twitter, we would love for everyone to join our Discord. I think it's a lot of fun. We always have people looking for games, so please do that. Uh, so you can follow us on social media on Twitter at Nintendo Jump. We're also on Instagram as Nintendo Jump. We, and we also have a Facebook group. So wherever you want to connect with us, definitely do that and and you know hit us up and we'll we'll definitely talk to you and, and play with you <laughs> when, whenever <laughs> we can, like a lot of the time. All of our episodes are on YouTube, so we love it when you guys, you know, give us views and comments there. Any on um, anything we discuss, any topics you'd like for us to talk about. Uh, we just recently opened up a new little channel in our Discord for episode talkback. So as you guys have opinions on any of this, love that, love all that discussion. Please do it. Mm. And finally, you can send us your feedback through any of our social media accounts or on Discord or via our email address at Nintendo Jump Podcast, Nintendo Jump Podcast at gmail.com. Or please, uh, our, our next music episode is kind of on the horizon. So please mm. uh, restart sending some music to us for our next music episode. Yes. Love doing those things. So we definitely want to do another one soon. And I'm planning for it to be another live episode. So we'll interact with people in our Discord. It's a really fun time. So please send us any gaming music suggestions you have. Uh, if you've already sent them in, they are on a list. So do not fear. Yes. Uh, and finally, mm -hmm. if you want to support the show, the best way to do it by far is through our Patreon, uh, which is it's patreon.com slash Nintendo Jump. Yeah, we did open it up. We have a, a few tiers there. That's It's awesome. We really, really love our patrons. They allow us to do some contests and things like that, just like our Smash tournament recently. Mm -hmm. We want to do more of those. So, yeah, that's easily the best way to support us. The second best way to support us would be to leave us likes, reviews, comments on our Twitter, things like that. Particularly, I would love to see more iTunes reviews. If you guys um, could come through, that would be awesome. You know, get us just... It helps us a little bit get a little more visibility and actually show up in the store a little bit more. So yeah, all every little bit helps. Everybody who's reviewed us already, thank you so much. We we just really appreciate it. So once again, just to wrap this up, uh, this is Sergio. Oh, wait, no, um, this is this is Daryl. <laughs> and Whoa. on behalf of Sergio and Kevin, at, I mean, you know, a little behind the curtain here. I am. I I Sergio did send me a script and he did replace my name. So that was. Eh. <laughs> it does say, say Daryl I'm actually gonna make a funny mm -hmm. anyways this is Daryl on behalf of Sergio and Kevin <laughs> thank you for listening we hope you all have an absolutely fantastic week and we will catch you next one goodbye everybody <laughs> From F zero to <laughs> to Tacos Island. I love that we're calling that. <laughs> We're just All right, bye, everybody. <laughs> bye, everybody. Bye.